Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Influential You podcast. I'm Josh D'Amigo, program faculty member for Influential You and your host for this weekly podcast. At Influential You, we teach you how to take charge of your career and amplify your professional influence. Since 2009, we have helped thousands of business owners, executives, and entrepreneurs become more influential, more rewarded, and more you. Today, we are beginning a series we are calling Legends on Legends. Now, at Influential You, we have a group that is held in our highest regard and admiration. This group is our esteemed alumni. Esteemed alumni are those who have completed our four-year curriculum in transactional competence. And the most ambitious of our esteemed alumni, or our Green Berets, if you will, study in our program, Legends. Our legends are often top performers in their field and have experienced a level of satisfaction that only comes from years of deliberate practice and study. The program is led in fellowship with co-founders Kirkland Tibbles and John Patterson, and this initiative includes a wide range of strategies to advance and expand our application of transactional competence and pave the path in the study of transactional leadership. Over the course and over the next few months, we'll have special episodes of the Influential You podcast. I'll be introducing two guests and then getting out of the way so that you may experience the expertise and communications between two of our participants. Now, if you listen closely, I believe that you'll hear a level of transactional leadership and transactional competence that is quite novel in regular day conversations. Today, we are welcoming Karina Christensen and Andrew Krellin to our Legends on Legends series. Now, I'm going to give you a brief uh, introduction to each. Karina Christensen is a fan favorite of our podcast. She is the co-founder of Contigo Ventures Baja out of Baja, Mexico, by way of Denver, Colorado, where she is in the midst of developing high design condo projects that enhance the natural beauty of the local Mexican environment. She identifies as a performer personality and holds a constructivist worldview. You've seen her on our podcast before, and she always brings an infectious energy and enthusiasm to everything she touches. And you can find out more about her project by going to contigocerritos.com, and we'll put that up on the bottom of the screen during the podcast. Andrew Krellin is the managing director of Sterling and Currency out of Perth, Australia, where he works as a numismatist or dealer in rare coins and banknotes. He identifies as a producer personality and holds an objectivist worldview. His specialties include the identification, appraisal, and research of Australian rare coins and banknotes, and he's an avid learner, and you can find more about his company by going to sterlingcurrency.com.au. Please welcome Karina Christensen and Andrew Krellin to the Influential You podcast. Hey, Josh. Hello, Karina. Hi, Andrew. I'm going to get out of the way and let you guys start to transact. Have a great show. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Karina. How are you doing? Good. It's been a not. It hasn't been that long. We we saw each other at the last conference in January, right? Yes, Hollywood. Yeah, because otherwise we're worlds apart. Um, where are you in? Where do you live again? So I'm in Western Australia on the far side. Um, in the port town of Fremantle, so it's part of Perth. Oh, that's right. That's right. And I'm currently just north of Cabo, Mexico. So we're we're literally worlds and oceans apart. <laughs> Both on the ocean. That's right. And uh, and I uh, when we set up this call, it was a little tough because it, what is it? Five o'clock your time in the morning. Yes. Yeah. And it is one o'clock here, and I was um, impressed because you said you were going to get up and take an ice bath. So I figured um, I figured I need something <laughs> to get my level of objectivist energy up to your level. So we'll see <laughs> if the ice bath is going to do it or not. That's funny. How are you feeling? You look pretty up. You look pretty awake. I have to say. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm, I'm psyched about um, I'm psyched about this conversation um, to get to know you a little bit better and to. Uh, and to play a little bit with transactional competence. I love it. I'm looking forward to it too. Um, you know, what I don't know about you is what what brought you to influence, uh, Influential You in the first place? We've we've been there together for a few years, but I actually don't know your story of um, how you ended up joining Influential You. Yeah, so the podcast. 
So uh, that's a that's a short answer. So my um, my brother came across the Influential You uh, podcast some time ago and um, sent it on to me. We'd done similar exploration of personal development work or professional development work um, over the years, and he said, "Listen, you want to you want to." Uh, listen to this podcast. I think I listened to an episode and then there was a um, an event here in Perth uh, with Drew Knowles and I attended that and I said, hey, this, this sounds like something that's really, really worthwhile and pursuing and I've been with it ever since. And, and how long ago was that? That was November 2017. I started the oh, okay. transaction course. How about yourself? How did you, how did you come... You know, it was a Facebook post <laughs> to talk wow. about. We were, uh, my husband, uh, Ron, and I had always been in some kind of an education program. And mm -hmm. we had just finished pretty much all the programs of the past company that we were part of. And it was 2016, so about a year before you joined. And I was ready for something new. And I was on Facebook scrolling. And one of my friends <clears throat> had posted about this conference that she'd been to with Influential You. And I looked it up and I knew that that friend, if she was doing something, it would be real highly um, exciting and highly valuable. So I went, you know, checked it out and I applied immediately. I thought it was something that would be really helpful. And it sounded like something Ron and I could do together again. And yeah, we started in, I think in June of 2016. Mm. And we've been doing it ever since together, which has been fun. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that there can often be a honeymoon period when it comes to a new uh, school of thought or uh, learning. Learning. Um, with that in mind, how, how, you've, you've obviously stuck with it since then, so it's been, what, six, seven years. How, how is it you continue to participate or why? What, what's the value that you get for yourself? You know, what I found is that in previous programs, <clears throat> you know, you take a program and then you integrate whatever you're learning for a few months, maybe six months, and then you fall off the wagon and then you take another program, you know, and it's all this, this, and I've taken a lot of these weekend programs and you get excited and then you come home and you're excited for a couple of weeks, but it was nothing that would stick. I know. Right. And I, mm. you know, I get, I'm easily excitable. So it was nothing that would stick. And what we found with this program was that it built upon each other and every course was, a, was the foundation for the next course. And it created an, a rigorous environment for us that I realized that I am somebody that treasures my freedom, right? I don't wanna be told what to do. I don't wanna have a structure. But I also realized that if I wanted to achieve things, I needed a structure around me to, you know, to achieve the things that I want to do. And we found that the longer we were part of this program, the exact opposite actually happened. We, we wanted to be like, find out what's the next step, right? What's the next step and how deeper can we go versus wide? We're going deep. And I think that's what has us coming back. And for me, it's basically my, my life structure. I can't imagine not doing this you know, w without this, really. Mm. Um, yeah. What about you? Yeah. So I, I think the I, much like yourself, I, I was at a time when um, I I was looking for more. I had the capacity uh, to to look for more um, input in different approaches to the things that I've been doing. So I bootstrapped my own business. Um, started off in 2006. It's been a long period after the GFC. And then around that 2017 time, it was a reasonable level of comfort, but I wanted to push to the next level. And there was an equal balance of uh, challenge and excitement. Um, mm -hmm. Not like the excitement, but something, anticipation that something was more, something else was available uh, through uh, through participating in it. And that that's what uh, that was what was appealing at that time. And I, I think, you know, to me, you know, if uh, there are some people when they hear the word structure, they they feel sick. That, oh, my God, structure. But and I, I think <laughs> that um, that is part of the appeal. So building what we what we term a consequential environment around the commitments that I make mm -hmm. instead of just 
saying, oh, I'm going to fly to the moon or even something more grounded, I'm going to uh, lose five kilos or I'm going to learn how to speak Italian, uh, like to have a commitment, but then to make it real and then to be known for that commitment yeah. and to have a structure and a consequence around fulfilling on that or not, that has been, it's been eye-opening, uh, the, the power that um, having an environment around uh, an aim like that, the, the, how much it makes available, how, how, more, how more quickly it accelerates progress. Progress, right? Yeah, and you know, it's funny. So you are, <clears throat> my husband Ron is your personality, the producer personality. And what I found with him was that, you know, he's happy doing, right? He's happy doing, doing, doing. And if, he's, if there's nothing structured, um, then he'll do something. <laughs> yeah. It might not yeah. be helpful, right? Have you found that for yourself? You know what? So there's, there's two, what we call the uh, infinity loops, which is the ways that, uh, we, that we continue to do things. Uh, so we get off track. So each of us personality types has a way of getting on track. So for the producer, it can be continuing to do the same thing ad nauseum without checking whether that's the right thing to do or not, whether it's generating results or not, or coming up with new things to do and not checking whether they are in line with a strategy or, or with an objective or not. And I have, if there are 999 errors that somebody could make in the way that they <laughs> occupy their time, I'm pretty sure I've made each of them. Have you? Um, yeah. So, yeah, in finding finding things to do, you know, and that's, I, I haven't spoken to Ron about it, but that's for, for the producer personality type, wanting to do things is out of service. Um, mm. So that um, constant need for uh, activity is a way of expressing um, our dedication to those that are around us. Oh, Oh yes, absolutely. You're here to help. You want to be of service. You want to, yeah. I get that. I, I really do. So I I had the pleasure of meeting your wife at the conference, mm -hmm. and you have attended for all these years. And 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 how has that? I'm just curious because you know I'm yeah. a little nosy. But how has that changed um, or helped in your relationship? You know, I I think if we look at so for me. Knowing that I, knowing that I am objective and that my wife is subjective, knowing that we occupy uh, uh, different, knowing that we have different approaches and that's okay, I think that then takes a level of sting out of any um, uh, disagreements or spirited discussions we might have. So that's the first thing. Knowing knowing that we can each do things uh, with more ease than the other, we can do certain things with more ease than the other, then there's not that blame when it comes to something in particular in our relationship that's not taken care of. Mm. So, yeah, we, we, we each have our own lane when it comes to uh, thinking about things and we're able to complement each other um, consciously i mean all couples i think whether they are um aligned in terms of their personality uh, or not um give each other the space to to be the way they are but i think being conscious of the difference and accepting that as being okay uh, that's been something that's been uh, empowering yeah and i i remember when i first met you you were pretty intense <laughs> <laughs> I felt that like you were very intense. And then when you told me that you were a numismatist, which I had no idea what that was when we first met, um, I thought, well, why would he be so intense working with coins? Like how, how would you get so wrapped up around, you know, dealing in coins? So I was always a little curious about where, you know, where that intensity came from when we first met. Yeah, so and it, it's interesting it's interesting that you say that. So again, I, I would tie it back to I, I could be piling rocks and I would have the same, I, I expect, sadly, that I would have the same level of intensity or dedication to doing yeah. something like that. Yeah, whether I can it, see that. Whether it was curing cancer, 
studying buying and selling rare coins or stacking rocks. I probably right. have the same approach. Yeah. yeah. And so I probably dial back to that uh, where we talked uh, before about that commitment to service and mm. you know, turning up at a um, if it, if that level of intensity has been reflected in my earnestness to study mm -hmm. and uh, answering questions in a in a classroom, then that's that's out of a a level of uh, commitment to uh, myself, my family, and my community, and being able to provide or to to share my knowledge and to and to help people. Um, so I, I think that's I think that's where it I think yeah. that's where it comes from. So if I have dialed that back such that it doesn't you know cause a mood shift over there, then that's great. I think so. I I thought that was palpable, and um, I, I think that's one of those things that you know. I'm familiar with in my relationship that it's once you understand that you're you're driven by doing what no matter what it is right you can allow yourself to dial it back when it really is not of that much consequence and it's made a lot you know for me in our lives life is a lot lighter uh, because not there's always this churning going on right and I'm uh, yeah, yeah. yeah and for me you know I am exactly the opposite I'm like this balloon that Ron has to try and, you know, where are you going next? Where is your, where is your string, right? And, and so it's been, um, it's been really great, um, you know, being able to dial back those parts of our personalities that are not serving us necessarily, right? Um, and also becoming aware of them and then also appreciating those qualities that we have for each other. So I think that's really great. One of the things I'd say about that, Karina, so one of the things that I value about having um, a bubbly, vivacious person in my life, like yourself, is that you're, you're, you're not... So when I stand next to somebody at a party and I've got this face on, a, a bubbly, uh, what we might term a performer personality type, might look at me and go, oh, my God, there's that guy. He's going to start talking about coins. <laughs> and he's so earnest. Just kill me. So whereas people, so for, for yourself, I haven't, I haven't, fortunately, I haven't yet experienced that uh, from you, right? But So what I want to acknowledge you for and what I think you and your personality type bring to a social situation is that you don't take that as being a cue to alter your behavior if that makes sense so you and it's so it's so much of service to me as an objective person to have somebody who is prepared to be themselves and bubbly and i'm not talking about being giddy inappropriately um silly but to be to be generous with your spirit to be relaxed and to to to, to bring a certain lightness to a discussion, whether it's social or whether it's professional, that is something that really contributes to what we would term making a transaction quicker and more effective. So thank you for bringing some um, energy to this uh, as well as everything else that we've had together. Well, I really appreciate that. that know, this, this was one of those um, things that I always thought there was something wrong with me because people were always telling me in situations previously that you know you're too perky you're too bubbly and I always thought that there was something wrong and I think that that was one of those other big aha moments you know, during our influential you programs is that there is a there is a time and a place to bring that kind of mood right to the table to make this transaction work better and I no longer make myself wrong for it but I also realize that they are parts of that transaction where that is not appropriate. You know, perky mm -hmm. and bubbly during a contract negotiation is probably not the way to go, right? Or when we're looking at what has gone wrong and what are, what are the things that are not working, for me to just continuously point out the things that have done well is not helping us along to figure out where do we, do we need to switch course or do we need to improve something? And I always thought that the people that when we call them judge personalities, right, that are always the ones that look at the holes and not the cheese, were the ones that were just raining on my parade. I just had mm. the hardest time with that personality. I grew up, my mother was a judge. Um, I was, my, my past relationship was a judge. I was miserable the whole time because mm. 
in a lot of ways, they could only look at things that weren't there or were, you know, I, I wasn't, but they were trying to help me, but they couldn't couch it in a way that I would hear. I just heard that there was something wrong with me, right? And mm. so that for me was really personally the biggest breakthrough in, in this whole education is to really value those people that are more that are more um, judgmental. They look more at the, you know, at the holes in the road that are coming up and we need that, right? I want to know what some of the issues are Absolutely. in a big project, right? That's going to, might mm -hmm. hurt me. And mm -hmm. so that was really the, one of the biggest things that I've learned to appreciate. And now I can listen to those people that are being very skeptical, especially when we're doing this project, right? And they're just asking questions that are going to help me, right? That are going to help us. So yeah. that I found incredibly invaluable. And I, I would say that having the the bubbly, vivacious, and you know that's having the having the ability to be a light mood, even in a contract negotiation, it might not necessarily show up as being you know blowing bubbles and throwing glitter in the air and something <laughs> like that. But being being calm in the negotiation, having a smile while being um, objective about the facts that can make that phase of a, of a transaction or a contract negotiation go much more easily. And I, I think that's, that's a, one of the things that um, I wanted to, to touch on with you was your, your, your bubbly personality is one that's, so that, that, that aspect of who you are is something that's discussed first, but what I can see with you, with your, uh, career arc and with the 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 focus of your uh, professional activity and your health activity is that there's a certain steel in the way that you approach things and there's a certain standard that you have and I don't know that that's always touched on and I'm so I'm, I'm intrigued your your transition from your earlier professional career where you work with some incredible people into real estate what was the what was the changing doors moment? Was that something that you fell into? Was it was it something was that the biggest game in town? Or how did you come how did you come into real estate? No, it was actually something completely different. And what you're uh, referring to is I used to on private jets as a flight attendant for many many years and for some big names, right and. Um, my my last stint was with Oprah for five years, and I think that's what you're referring to. It's just so that yes. listeners know that don't know me, but I loved like loved 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 my my work with her. I loved my job, um, but I got it later in life, and I was in my late 40s, and I realized that if I don't move on to something else, I will be doing that for the rest of my life, and I'll be living someone else's life. For the rest mm -hmm. of my life and i've seen how loyal she was and how loyal her staff was and people had been with her 30 and 40 years and i just couldn't see myself doing that for the next you know next even next five so i've always been passionate about real estate i literally when i was a kid you know how little kids draw stick figures and flowers well i was drawing floor plans okay. so um at four years old I, i've always <laughs> wanted to be a developer it was weird i didn't know i didn't know one in my life my parents we're not related to an architect. I mean, nothing. So mm -hmm. um, after about five years of working for Oprah, I realized that I think it was time to make a move. I was living in Chicago. I've been dying to move to Montana. I, I grew up watching Bonanza as a kid in Germany, and those big open white spaces were very appealing to me. And when I moved there, I decided that it was, you know, it was a good time for me to finally follow what I love to do, which is real estate. I got my real estate license. I happened to meet a local developer. We hoped to get into developing a big project. And that was in 2007 and 2008. And right Gosh. before we were about to get our first $6 million check, uh, Lehman Brothers, who was going to write the check, collapsed. And wow. so all this whole project we had been working on for a couple of years came to naught. But I realized that that's what my passion was. I love creating things from nothing. 
um, happened to meet another person in the same town that was working on a condo project. Her backers had backed out. I happened to have the original people that I had for my project that were still willing to invest in something. And so we took over that 60 unit condo project uh, in downtown Helena, Montana, turned it into, you know, turned it into condos. And that was really successful. It was on the bottom of the market, 2009 and 2010. And I think for me, and when you asked whether, you know, was it a big breakthrough for, for me, it's very sequential. I meet people, right? It's I'm a people person. Um, I meet people. And then when I get an inkling of what sounds good to me, I have, I tend to look for those kind of people. I, I, I tend to look that for that ecology where mm. I might get to do and play in that. Right. And I've done that mm. as I'm looking back. And this is actually a really great question. As I'm looking back, it was always the people first. And then the projects came second. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you look for a certain people you want to play with and, mm -hmm. and it happened the same way with our project here in, in, in Baja, we fell in love with the area down here. We bought a lot five years ago and then during COVID, we spent a lot of time here in Mexico because Ron could work remotely and we were like, Hey, I'm not hanging out in Denver. No, no restaurants are open. Let's go and hang out in the Baja. And we fell in love with the amazing culture down here uh, and made some really good friends. And one of them was our broker. And, you know, we had told him that, man, if you ever see any of these lots on this oceanfront property come up for sale, call us. And long story short, you know, he did. There were five lots that came for sale. And because we were friends, he called us first. So, and then, you know, we ended up with this project down here. But I think it's always, it's people led. Right. I'm I find the people that I want to play with. And that's how I find my projects. How about you? Like, how did you I've been meaning to ask you, like, how does one get into being a numismatist? You know, how do you I had that as a hobby. I collected stamps and coins as a kid. Right. I'm, I'm sure not many people do. But how do you get into that as a profession? So I for my path. I didn't collect coins as a kid myself, but when I graduated from university, um, I lived in Japan for a couple of years. So I, I mm -hmm. gained a, a basic level of fluency. And when I returned to Australia, um, I wanted to work for a company that uh, dealt in Australian products and exported them to Japan. And that was quite a, a tough time in the Australian economy. So I got a job at the Perth Mint, which manufactures uh -oh. Australia's precious metal coins. Um, so that was on the shop floor in retail, and I had the idea that I would work my way into the marketing department from there. Um, that was a great plan, but it didn't work. Um, so I ended up staying on the shop floor uh, for a couple of years and then was offered a job in numismatics by a dealer in Sydney, which sounded incredibly exotic. Uh, so then I, I packed up and moved to the other side of the country and so I've long had a, uh, an interest in history. I love the, the idea that we can have a tangible link to a historical mm. person, the Charles II, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, or whoever it may be, having a tangible link to a, a, a point in time, something that's rare and valuable. I, I, love the, I love the idea of that. And so I have been doing it ever since. That's amazing. And you know, um, what kind of like what kind of people do you meet like that that are into this? Because I know you love working with these things, but it's a, it's a people business, right? Who comes to you for coins and advice and and you know for your professional advice? Yeah, so we it's it's an one of the interesting things that um, I have picked up out of my study with uh, influential you is the this idea of a uh, specific customer. So having a target market to really dialing in on who do I serve and how do I serve them? So I have two different um, target markets. I deal with people that are looking to sell uh, mm -hmm. coins and currency here in uh, the city of Perth in Australia. Mm -hmm. I also deal with people who collect rare coins and currency and they can be anywhere. 
So my inventory, I, have, I, I can't source it from a mint. Um, if I want a gold sovereign from 1920, I have to track it down, much like real estate. I have to, I have to find it oh. and source it and then match it up. Um, so the, the, the people that we buy from can be from any walk of life. Somebody that has a couple of old coins in a jar and they're moving house and they want to find out about it, right up to people that have inherited uh, a large and valuable coin collection from their grandfather. The people that I look to sell to, um, that we focus on, like my specific customer, is generally some, this is going to come as a complete shock to you. It'll be male, older than average, uh, slightly higher uh, disposable income than average. Mm -hmm. And they look to partner with someone who can help them uh, accelerate their knowledge acquisition and accelerate the, the acquisition of the items that they collect. So I, I really, I, there are some people who like to DIY their coin collection. Mm -hmm. Everyone's on a continuum of some way of how much they want to do themselves and how much they want to partner with someone. But I, I focus on people that are looking to, they might be time poor but asset rich and they, they are prepared to pay for expertise mm -hmm. uh, in order to get where they want to go. I, I love that. Yeah, that which is so perfect, right? Because you said it, we had to figure out who is your, I mean, there's a lot of people that are going to want your expertise, right? But you only have so much time. So who are the people that you choose to work with that are going to be, you know, the highest and best use of your time? And which, the ones that I can provide the most value to. Value to. So, yeah, the, so there are a lot of people who, a number of the articles that I've written um as part of our participation in the Legends program have been about what we would call the early stages of the transaction cycle, where we make an invitation to, to a potential customer. Would you like to hear about what I do? Um, or this is what I do, or these are the terms upon which I'm prepared to help. And probably the biggest thing that I have gained from, not, not the biggest thing, but one of the, one of the things that I've gained from studying with Influential You is the ability to quickly identify someone who I can, I can I, not only can I help them, but I can help them in a way that serves my own uh, objectives. Aims. Yeah. Not in a Machiavellian way, but no. there's a mutual satisfaction of aims. There's a and, mutual synergy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if, if we can't, then I'm, I decline quickly or I, mm. I provide them with free resources that they can use to, to, to get the information that they want without being a drain on my time. I love that because I think that that was one of the biggest pieces that we've learned for our project here is that not everybody is my client and we don't yeah. want just everybody in our project, right? Mm -hmm. We interview just like potential buyers interview us, we interview potential buyers and we've actually declined two people <laughs> because that, we didn't think that... yeah. sorry to i'm so excited no that's perfect <laughs> it's because that it's because it we it wasn't going to serve their aims we 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 heard what they were trying to do for instance they were trying to find a cash flow property right but mm. we're, what we're selling is a community this isn't mm. all about cap rates and return on investment i mean yes you will mm. get some of that but we're building a community. So somebody solely looking at this from a cash flow perspective, it's just not, it's not going to be a fit for them and it's not going to be a fit for us. And it was such a big revelation for us that we get to do this, that it has made this whole process really fun. And, how, do and people, really, yeah. how do people respond when you interject or you raise the idea? Thank you for your interest. We really appreciate it. We have a couple of questions for you. Are you prepared to hear that? Yeah. Yes. How do, how do people how do people receive that when you when you raise the notion of interviewing them? You know, I think we've gotten even the people that we didn't accept their offer were they they you know they were basic like wow we've, we've never had this experience that we actually were talking about our aims in this transaction because we would ask them what's your aim in being part of this project what's your aim for this condo what are you hoping to achieve. And I think in the end, they really realized that they weren't clear about their aims. They weren't clear whether this is the right investment for them or this is the right community for them or the right environment. 
And they were really surprised. They had not had that kind of conversation before. So it's been, it's been a really just a, a fantastic journey so far. Mm. So you, you mentioned, you've mentioned, I think real estate for me, because it's such a high stakes uh, game and because there's so much emotion to it, uh, it can be a situation in which people respond in the way that they're most familiar. So whether it be quid pro quo or um, winning at the expense of somebody else, how have you found transactional competence to be a benefit in the way that you work with uh, folks in real estate? You know, and I'm, I'm going to keep this very short because I know we're sort of running out of time because time is flying, Andrew. We should have had an hour for this. I can't wait to continue this right, conversation. Right. But very quickly, I think one of the things that we always start with and we start with that in Influential You is asking what's your aim? Because if their aims match our aims, it's a match. And everybody that we've talked to where their aims match our aims have become a client and will be our neighbors. And I think mm -hmm. that is the fastest and best way to figure out whether you can be in business with them. Yeah, meeting of the minds. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Hey, Josh. Hey, guys, that was so <laughs> fun. And I, you should see the Legends chat going on. It is a blast <laughs> to hear you guys. We've finally been able to answer the question, what happens when a real estate developer and a numismatist walk into a bar? So that is really fun. <laughs> Quick, quick question for you as as we kind of um end the end the interview do you, are you guys in a study group together have you had more than one conversation i mean you've had a, a few but how do you how well do you guys know each other on a kind of surface level i, I think we yeah I, I don't know i mean about you we've met we've been at a couple of conferences together we've been at a couple of breakout sessions but i we've Apart from that, maybe a short conversation over wine at a happy hour. We haven't really had a chance yeah, to really three, talk. I would agree. Maybe two or three conversations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and unfortunately. Then, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, right? But then uh, to have this and to have that conversation and to kind of watch you guys speak, tell me a little bit about that experience of what it was like to you know really get to kind of know each other on a different level, the 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 quality of the conversation, the questions. I'd love to hear just a little bit from your opinion of what that was like to meet someone brand new, live in front of people, practicing uh, your exchange. Would you like go. to go, Corinna? Oh, sure. So, <laughs> yes. You know, it's always surprising to me. Um, I still have a thing about being in the virtual world about Zoom. You know, it's not as good as in person, and it isn't, right? I mean, there is something about being in person. But having somebody who is, you know, has has been trained in being present and be, and asking really great questions, and also understands other people's personality and playing with that is such a great experience and to be on the other end of that because this conversation was about as fluid as as it can be, right? It's like we've known each other for a long time, and even though we don't, it was it was really it was great it was intense the questions were just brilliant andrew's questions really really um hit for me and really made me think about and ponder about some of the choices i've made in my past so it was super enjoyable yeah i i, I agree and i i think I, I spoke before about the value to me of being with someone who is not um afraid to be themselves has the courage to be themselves and i think that that helps uh, bring me out uh, that so that helps bring me out of my objective grounded um, normal state of being and I and I, th I think being able to trust who we are and how we approach things uh, Josh to answer your question yeah be being in a being with someone who has that uh, approach to conversing with other people it allows me to be who I am not not to make it wrong that I'm uh, grounded and uh, always focused on moving things forward uh, and to trust that that's going to work out as being conversation of value. Yeah. 
And I'll, I'll say it was, it was so enjoyable watching the two of you converse, knowing that in the background, hey, they may, this may be some of the first deep conversations that they're having, and to see the level that you got to was really a joy. Uh, anything you guys would like to say uh, as we uh, leave? Can't wait to see you in person, Andrew. We need to catch up. Like, there's so many more questions I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's a, Karine, I, I appreciate you um, making time, and um, uh, it's been a real privilege to to get to know you. I hope the uh, the, the the project in Baja um, comes off really well, and I, I look forward to hearing how it unfolds. Great, wonderful. Thank you. Oh, and we thank did, you guys we did so much. And thank you, Josh. <laughs> And I'll see you guys soon, very soon on the next Legends call. Uh, I'm going to take you guys out now, and we're going to wrap up by saying this. If you liked what you saw, and I think you probably did, and you want to know more about us, I invite you to go to influentialu.global and explore our courses, consulting, and conferences. We offer a four-year curriculum for those that are seeking an advanced experience like you just saw with Karina and Andrew. However, if you're new to Influential U, we recommend you start with Thrive. It's our self-guided training. Now, Thrive is a self-guided program that lets you learn at your own pace. Thrive members enjoy weekly live e-coaching sessions and an ever-expanding library of exclusive video lessons with our faculty, thought leaders, and industry experts. You'll get proven proprietary tools to accurately assess your career and develop a realistic strategy to achieve your aims faster. Your membership also includes chat access to faculty plus discounts to our transformative conferences. You can sign up today and use promo code 20 off. That's 20 O F F for a 20% discount on the monthly subscription. That's coupon code 20 O F F or 20 off. Thank you so much for listening today. Each week we stream this podcast live at 2 PM Pacific on our website, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So you can easily share this podcast with others. You can also subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or any other place you get quality podcasts. Check out our show notes for links to connect with our guests, plus links to their websites, books, or special downloads that they may have talked about in today's episode. This podcast is made possible by the Influential Youth staff, faculty, and members all around the world, with special thanks to our executive producer, Tyson Crandall, and contributions from John Patterson, Michael Teehee, Joey Anderley, Daryl Anderley, Paul West, and Liz Smiley, and a special thanks to our legends, Karina Christensen with ContigoCerritos.com or Contigo Cerritos, and Andrew Krellen with Sterling and Currency. And you just have to meet those two. They're wonderful. Look them up on LinkedIn. They're both great, wonderful human beings. The Influential You podcast is produced by Influence Ecology LLC in Ventura, California. This episode was recorded on March 22nd, 2023. The podcast theme is by Chris Standring, entitled Fast Train to Everywhere. And if you haven't yet offered a rating or review, I ask that you take a moment, go to iTunes or your podcast app, and let us know what you think. This helps us more than you know. We'll see you next time on the Influential You Podcast. Thank you.